So welcome all to this episode of the North Central Stair Program's Farming Matters series. Farming Matters is all about celebrating and learning from um, our farmer rancher grantees. I'm Erin Schneider, your host. I work with the North Central Stair Program. I also farm um, just outside of the Wisconsin Dells area, um, Hilltop Community Farm. Um, so Marcus, I, welcome. Marcus is in the, what is you know, now kind of known as the Green Bay area in Wisconsin. Um, he also is part of Indigenous Think Tank and here to share a perspective on hemp production. And Marcus, I will turn it over to you because there are lots of wonderful layers and insights you can get to share with us today. So thanks for being with us. Well, Lennon, Oso Maniwiak, Nakato Manowich, Kikitim, Kispi So Makake, Anit Nakayan, Mashik Nawiswan, Marcus Greeno. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to speak. Uh, my people know me as Kispi So McCake or Swift Daughter and was named Marcus Greeno by my parents. Um, I am the operator of Indigenous Think Tank, which is a uh, agricultural research um, for-profit organization, which kind of um, oversees my farm and the research that I do in terms of agriculture. And then I also um, wear another hat where I am the uh, executive director of Hempstead Project Heart, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to redevelop thriving hemp economies that connect tribal, urban, and rural communities throughout the United States. And I'm also a hemp researcher at the College of Miami Nation, a 1994 land grant university um, based on the Miami Indian Reservation in Kashina, Wisconsin. Basically, how I've taken um, my approach in a lot of things I've done in my professional careers, I've always thought about the indigenous perspective. And what I mean by that is really looking at a traditional ecological knowledge um, point of view on a lot of different things. Um, everything from, you know, my work in uh, the green economy and green jobs to now I'm in agriculture. And I've been in agriculture for, I want to say, um, really into it um, since 2015. Um, before that, I was a advocate and I worked with um, the Growing Food and Justice for All initiative through Growing Power. So I was really, um, my, I entered the agriculture space as an urban farmer or urban agriculture or urban Indian, if we want to really get even further into it. And um, I was just really, I really enjoyed it. And I think the first time working in a farm was obviously working on hemp. So in 2015, I was able to be a student researcher on a hemp project on my reservation. And I just remember being out there and, you know, weeding the rows. I think we had like about three acres of hemp growing and I was like weeding everything, <laughs> like taking all the natural vegetation out and making sure the hemp plants grew um, a lot easier and without any competition around them. And I just remember... Uh, I was like, I'm never going to work another office job again. Uh, that's like still one of my goals as a farmer is like, you know, I think a lot of beginning farmers, we we come from the perspective of like, we have to be on the farm part time and then we have a job full time. And so that's kind of where I'm at. And I share that with a lot of my uh, fellow um, beginning farmers. Um, and so it's just, I don't know, it took took me over. And then um, I started doing more work in advocacy work, as well as um, farming with hemp and doing research. And what I think I really, what fascinated me the most about hemp production and hemp research is that it's been like taboo for, you know, 70 years before the 2014 Farm Bill, and then the 2018 Farm Bill. And to me, I was just like, man, this is a an opportunity where people could really, you know, learn a lot of different things. And there's a lot of versatility in the research. And so that's kind of where I got into uh, hemp research was really just one, the uncharted territory we have, and two, um, the fact that we kind of need an Indigenous perspective spin to it. Um, the closest Indigenous perspective we had was probably Alex Whiteplume in 2000 and 2001 on his uh, farm in Pine Ridge when he was doing hemp production. And so I really wanted to continue that um, way of thought. And so um, I've kind of broken down my 
my slide and my presentations down here and looking at both the environment, um, climate change, but then also like um, thinking about like, where is the future going? And also like what I learned in some of this research that I've done. So when we think about in the environment aspect of hemp research and hemp production, uh, let's kind of like place it somewhere for me um, as a farmer. And it was 2020. Um, the pandemic was raging on. A lot of us were all basically home. Um, and some days when I just didn't want to stay inside, I'd go to the field and I just hang out for a while and work and um, observe. Cause really, you know, as a, as a Menominee, um, it's really about learning by observing, or as the Menominee say, Kikata Wapata, learning by observation. And for me, one of the things I learned from farmers over the years, because, you know, like as an advocate, I would go and I'd interview farmers and learn from them and understand what their issues were. And sometimes I get a little chance to ask, you know, as someone that aspires to be a farmer someday, what advice do you have? And a lot of the farmers I talked to was always like saying to me, just observe, watch your field, watch what goes on. That's really where you're going to learn the most. And it really takes time, you know, like years and years and years of just observation. And so I really never forgot that. Um, and when I started doing my research in 2020 with the College of Menominee Nation, I started seeing um, these Japanese beetles. I didn't know what they were at the time. I was just like, why are there so many of these here? <laughs> and I'd see just a ton of them. And that's kind of where I... Um, I had the idea to apply for the SARE grant. I was really observing the environment and the natural world and how it's interacting with hemp in the Great Lakes region. And for me, some of the things aside from the Japanese beetles, so if you see there's the middle uh, picture with the darker um, bug or the beetle, that's a Japanese beetle. And if you look on the far right corner, that's another Japanese beetle. But then when you see me looking for that, the other two pictures, you know, you have, you have ladybugs. And this is something that I learned as um, a beginning farmer entering the hemp industry is like ladybugs are your, <laughs> your best line of defense when it comes to cannabis aphids. And I remember a story that I had of doing my research and I had all these aphids and I had to get rid of them. And so I started putting, um, soap and water mixing it together and try and get it off and like I ended up burning my plants and I was like oh my god and so I learned from that of like okay don't react so quickly you know see what happens because two weeks later the jap the ladybugs showed up and they started eating everything and my plants started doing better and so it's like really understanding and that was I learned in 2019 of let the natural world help you out with what you're producing um and so these ladybugs, I, every year I just love seeing them. I love seeing their larvae. I just love seeing them just crawl and move around. So this ladybug in the far left corner is uh, hanging out with a bunch of male hemp um, pollen sacs. And it looks like the pollen sacs just popped. So it's probably like if you planted your hemp uh, in May, late May, early June, you'd start seeing this happen probably at the end of end of July, beginning of August. Um, and then to the far right, top right, um, the tree frog. And I, what I love is I haven't seen any frogs really at all um, up until the stair project. And that's where I was, you know, just taking care of my plants, not really using anything um, to spray on them, even though I, I never really did aside from that soap and water solution. But uh, it's just fascinating to me to see the natural world interact with hemp. Another aspect that I want to talk about is climate change. Um, you know, as a beginning farmer, season beginning farmer, I have seven growing seasons under my belt, um, is that hemp is a really interesting plant in the sense that it's really good. Um, it's a really good food source. So, you know, you have high omega-3s, omega-6s, uh, has basically all the essential amino acids for the human body, and one tablespoon packs 10 grams of protein. Um, so when we look at these plants here and these pictures here, it starts out, you know, we plant, we 
planted this crop um, in 2020. And what was interesting about it was that, you know, we planted it, um, I want to say, like, it was June, like, 7th or 8th. And, uh, you know, we, we put, you know, uh, chemical fertilizer because we were curious about what, you know, what it could do. But also, I wanted to see how fast the plants could grow. Um, and if you notice from the far left corner, top, top left, that's kind of the beginning stages of it. I want to say like maybe a week and a half in. This is the one bottom left corner is around 4th of July. Middle one is middle of the month, uh, just right after 4th of July. And then the far right corner is the hemp at the end of July. So just in a matter of, you know, less than 60 days, this crop produced and had towering plants at least 14 feet high. Uh, what we've learned through this air project is that it can grow up to at least six feet tall with less than 10 inches of rainfall. This crop right here in 2020 never had any irrigation on it. We just let, we just let mother nature do its thing. So we look at the future of climate change and the issues of water and why as a human body, we need water. So how are we going to grow crops and survive? It's like hemp I see as something that's really great and something we can use to face the challenges of the 21st century that we are, we will have to deal with in the next few years. Um, so we go back to, you know, what I learned with these Japanese beetles. Um, they're not really a nuisance to hemp. And as a matter of fact, uh, the hemp actually um, <laughs> allows them to breed. Uh, I saw a lot of Japanese beetles breeding in the hemp. And I was kind of like, okay, is that a bad thing? You know, and so I started looking around at other natural vegetation around my hemp to see, you know, What's attracting it? Why are these Japanese beetles flocking to my hemp so much? Where are they coming from? And what I learned was they love other plants. So you see here this far left, this piece of vegetation that comes and grows up every year around my hemp. Japanese beetles love it. We look to uh, the right here. You know, it's, uh, I believe that's, I want to say it's a, just an early stage mullein. That could be wrong, but they like these plants. They also like mullein. Um, but what I really learned out of all of this is that those first two years of research at the college, we had a lot of Japanese beetles. That third year of research, we barely had any. And after talking with some of the farmers that work with me and um, what we came to conclusion about is actually it's pole beans that really attract Japanese beetles. So for folks who have um, crops that may be devastated by Japanese beetles, it'd be um, important to ensure that if there's any pole beans growing around, that you try and just plan um, your, uh, your production plans or just uh, taking into account that situation. Uh, something else I learned, we go back to Kekatawapata. Uh, learning by observation. What I really found fascinating was this happened in the fall. And I want to say this is like getting cold. Uh, I want to say towards beginning of October. And I saw all these yellow jackets just hanging out. And they're pulling all the sugar off of the uh, the flowers in the hemp. And they were they were deep in there. I mean... You know, they weren't just buzzing around, flying, like they were deep into that hemp flower and just, yeah, I'm going to play one more time. Um, they were just, I guess, getting all the sugar and getting ready for winter. That's kind of what I observed is they were kind of preparing themselves. In previous years, what I've learned with the hemp and observing it um, at, the, at a different plot was that, you know, we have um, ground beetles or ground, ground bees, my bad, nick that. So what I learned is that 
ground bees actually come out of the ground, go to the hemp plants, you know, that are in production. That was usually when I was growing CBD and they would pull all the sugars off those CBD flowers and bring them back into the ground and like prepare themselves for winter. So I just found it super fascinating that the natural world is starting to utilize hemp in a way and use hemp to kind of keep their populations surviving for through winter. And um, I just found it super fascinating. And I thought, you know, it's something that I learned if I were to, if I didn't have the, you know, mindset of pushing traditional ecological knowledge and I was just like, I just have to produce the best hemp that I can, you know, and I would start using pesticides, all that stuff. Like you wouldn't see these things. So like, you know, for like future sere farmers, future farmers, future beginning farmers, existing farmers, I, I really want to stress how much observation when it comes to farming is so important. And just seeing these things and watching the natural world interact with your crop is to me, um, one of the most interesting things that I will uh, I'll ever have as a farmer and be able to experience it as a farmer. Uh, we go back to these bees. You can see there's bumblebees everywhere um, and they're pulling all the pollen off the male hemp plants. And so it's something that I learned with our, um, our research with the SARE program is that we had... 60 60 bumblebees like all on one plant one day i couldn't believe it it was just all up and down the whole plant you know it was just all of them and they were just pulling all the pollen off and i just i was like wow this is really cool and it's it's allowing the hemp pollen to kind of spread out into other plants and you know it you know it really reminds me something that um you know, my cousin, cousin brother, cousin big brother, uh, Jeff Greeno. Um, he's a landscape ecologist. And something that he talks about is, you know, you have these elder plants and then you have the other plants around it, but the elder plant takes care of it. So when we look at, you know, the Menominee forest, when the Menominee people cut the cut portions of the forest down, we leave some of those elder trees up to kind of help, um, keep the established fungal network underneath operating and communicating because, you know, you keep the fungal network going, then you have all those other plant, all those trees and plants that are growing back up again after the trees have been cut, you have a elder kind of helping them out and supporting them as they keep growing and um, the ecology kind of continues. And what I think with hemp is, you know, it's one of those elder plants of, you know, it's supporting everybody. And this is something I learned the first year I did research is I saw all these plants, natural vegetation, flowers growing around the base of the hemp plants, and it would change the terpene profiles. It changed how they would grow. Um, it was just, to me, I found it um, very interesting and needs further research. So for other folks who are trying to figure out what to do with their SARE project, you know, researching companion planting and understanding natural vegetation and how it interacts with hemp production, I think is uh, a very worthwhile piece of research for folks that want to get into hemp research. One of the things that uh, this is like a, a plug on my end, but also a plug for the college is that we've been working on a feasibility study for um, the past four years. Um, COVID kind of put everything uh, slowed it down, let's say, for, for a matter of fact. But now we have have the opportunity where we're going to start publishing this document. And it's, it's exhaust, it's ex it is a large document. Um, it's definitely over 100 pages, but it really gets down to the nitty gritty for farmers in the Great Lakes region who want to learn and to grow hemp, but don't have the equipment. So we look at artisanal hemp production. For farmers, people who have an acre or two acres, but don't have, you know, heavy equipment to sustain it. There's a lot of strategies, tactics that I've, I've put into this feasibility study for farmers to utilize in their hemp production in the Great Lakes region. And I also have a list of information for farmers to um, pull from 
if they need certain pieces of equipment because they do have the acreage. So I have it broken down from, you know, zero to 100 acres and, you know, 100 acres over, this is the equipment you need. Um, if you're needing how to access capital, because that's always a big thing, you know, understand the difference between assets and liabilities. That's a huge thing for farmers. And so this document that we're going to have available for farmers, um, I want to say this spring. So we are just like going through everything out the nitty, the fine detail with a fine tooth comb, as I like to say, and making sure it, it all looks good, but it's going to be available for people. It's a public document produced by a land grant university, and it was supported by the American, um, the Native American Agriculture Fund, the College of Miami Nation. And what I find very interesting is that uh, the College of Miami Nation, in the same time that I received my SARE grant, received this large hemp supply chain grant focusing on hemp feed as a way to support um, fish production, so feeding fish. But what I love about this grant is that it, it carves out a space for the College of Miami Nation to create a research center around hemp. So the Great Lakes region will have a research center solely devoted to hemp production, and it'll be at the College of Miami Nation. And I just, I'm very proud of our community. I'm very proud of our college. But I'm just really looking forward to seeing what will come out of that. And so um, just to kind of like bring this all back around, because sometimes I'll go off on a tangent. But basically, the hemp feasibility study gives you details of what we did for our research. But then it also gives you folks a seven-year observational analysis of the American hemp industry. So I've been in the industry for, you know, it's, I want to say it's going to be going on a decade soon. So there's about seven years worth of information that I just observed and listened, and I want to be able to share it with everybody. Because I think one of the things that the hemp industry lacked in the beginning was that we didn't have enough information. And a lot of farmers just kind of grew and they didn't know um, where to go with it, or they were overpromised, or the contracts weren't um, all in place. So I really wanted something that people could really learn from and understand and utilize. And so that's kind of um, mine and the college's gift to the Great Lakes region is this document. So just putting that as a plug. Um, and then, so uh, Wawanen, thank you. Um, and feel free to reach out anytime with me. Um, there's my name. Um, that's my email. And then uh, that's my cell number. So any farmers that want to talk, you want to see the feasibility study or get a copy of it, you just let me know. And I'm, uh, I'm here to basically be uh, a resource for farmers in, in my region uh, around hemp production. So thank you. Thank you for that deep dive and just for your attentiveness and time with the hemp plant and sharing that perspective. Um, if someone was like another farmer is like, inspired by this and wants to maybe think about hemp on their land for like an acre or so like what would what's what's most helpful for you yeah so um um a regular old earth planter uh two-wheel thing you can find on the internet um a broadcaster uh, a lawn roller if you really want to get into um like heavier production or like you just don't want to like spend a whole day in an acre i know how it goes um, you can just get a regular old, uh, like, uh, like grain planter. And you, I think it's like, I want to say it's, you want to use the, um, it's like for peas, like peas or beans, um, the little, uh, cylinder that you put into the grain. Um, so those, those work really well for planting. Now, when it comes to harvesting, um, nothing cuts hemp better than a uh, um, <laughs> a good old fashioned sickle mower. Like, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how much I love sickle mowers, man. Like, <laughs> I got I, I I climbed in a tractor that first time, and I ran that sickle mower in 2020, and I was like, I will never go back to the office again. I will work from home if I have to cubicles and all that stuff. I'm done with that. <laughs> Just after riding that, that law, that, that tractor, man, it was awesome. I've used a garden rake to rake my stuff into rows. You can definitely use a, um, 
uh, hail, um, a bail, um, hay, uh, hay rake, you know, the speed rakes. You can use a speed <laughs> rake to kind of put it in rows. But I know that like hand raking, I hand raked four acres one year. And uh, that took me about four days, working eight hours every day. Um, but man, you can get it done. Um, and then with hemp, uh, hemp seed, it's like you, if you don't have a very large, um, <laughs> um, large piece of equipment to harvest it all, um, uh, I would say that you would want to, um, go out there and like basically pull the tops off or like knock them down into like a five gallon bucket. And then, you know, however many five gallon buckets you have, you gather them all together and then you use a, um, use like a grain cleaner. Uh, so I have an old classic one from the thirties that I found in some old farm in Wisconsin for like 200 bucks still runs. And uh, it still has a uh, a screen for hemp, <laughs> hemp seed. So I use that. Um, I've also sat in front of the TV and just cleaned my hemp seed in a, uh, <laughs> in a uh, you know, like use your kitchen equipment and like, you know, the colanders and like uh, strainers and everything else, clean it like that. But uh, the most effective way was to get a, a, grain, a grain cleaner. And then if you're selling your grain to somebody, you want to make sure that you um, sort and size it. So you're going to need those pieces of equipment to kind of really uh, do all that. In terms of like variety recommendations? Yeah. So top three varieties in the North Central region that um, we've learned over uh, just trial and error with the College of Miami Nation is... Uh, varieties Anka, Altair, uh, and X59 are like three top varieties that produce really well in this region. And both Anka and Altair can be um, fiber. They can also be grain crops. Um, X59 is a very mostly just only uh, grain crop. Anka and Altair are something else. They grow very fast, grow very tall, and they produce some pretty decent hemp fiber. Marcus, do you um, thinking of that whole life cycle then too? Are you are you um, with your when when you're harvesting? Are you saving back some seeds and for the next year? Yes, I've I've definitely like kept seeds aside. So like you know I have a I have one for like, we call it like F one F two F three F four. So I have all these different. Um, years of seed that I I still kind of kept and that's really for the college kind of help with them and developing their seed bank and um, that's another thing too another plug for the college of Menominee Nation Menominee will also have hemp seed for research and hopefully have hemp seed for um, north central region farmers to utilize in the future thank you so much yeah thank you guys thanks Aaron thank you take care yep see ya Bye. Bye.